with confidence as giants of the land, masters at adapting to any change. It was a system driven as much by the birth of new life as it was hinged on death. This was the essence of the old Africa of novels and films, a harsh tapestry of abundance, hardship, and violence. During these bloody battles, the balance of life gives both predators and prey a chance to win. For millions of years, mankind has been part of that system, hunting for survival and eating flesh for sustenance. But one strange characteristic now sets our species apart. Some say it is language or the capacity to be overwhelmed by emotions. But the real difference is as haunting as the images of our dreams. Only one species kills its victims for its horns or teeth. Only man slaughters for trade, leaving in its wake not only death, but suffering. But there are also those who can no longer bear to watch the devastation, and now seek to hunt down the hunters. Now, members of the same species do battle among themselves to save or kill the other species. The opponents are the poachers of Africa, and they are pursued by Botswana's wildlife warriors. Ian Kama, 
son of Botswana's founder and first president. His response was immediate. This was rapidly becoming a wildlife emergency, and he started deploying his men against the poachers. The new battlefield for this country, with fewer than one and a half million inhabitants, is carved out of the Kalahari Desert in southern Africa. Botswana's long international borders can easily be breached. It was in the north that poaching had exploded, burning like a wildfire, unchecked through the wilderness. As a conservationist, this new attack boiled inside General Kama. There was outrage when that black rhino was shot. Symbolized for us the arrival of serious perching. There came a time when we couldn't just stand by and watch our natural heritage disappear. We had to do something. Tracking down perches is really difficult. I mean, you can defend towns and strategic points in a country. But to defend a wilderness, how do you do that? So we employed everything we had available and developed our experience. Initially, we put 30 men into patrol, but soon realized that this was a much bigger problem and so had to increase our presence. Today, we have nearly 900 well-trained men in the field. As soldiers slowly comb the bush, they need to understand the signs. Scavengers drop down from the thermals and swirl onto the gunshot or snared animals that have limped off to die slow deaths. In the frenzy, an autopsy is often difficult, if not impossible. But from time to time, there is evidence of the fatal bullets, confirmation of the poacher's work. But each time, they seem to melt away into the undergrowth, like phantoms leaving behind artifacts of their grisly profession. From tiny snares to hastily abandoned loot. For the soldiers, this is a strange new war on a new battleground. The bush is hotter and more humid than the villages and towns most come from. For many, their only experience of animals came from the myths and legends of their elders' campfire tales. They will need more than just their weapons training to stay alive in the bush. The heat, the insects, the distant call of a lion after each drop-off are all unsettling. But the real danger can come from the men they hunt, somewhere out there in the silence. The way we are probably unique is that we are one of the few countries where the defense force is used to um, bring about a curb to poaching activities. Even from the highest level, our president has even um, gone out, he has taken time to visit our soldiers in their anti-poaching bases to see what they are doing. So when you have that type of interest and support at that level, then obviously we are bound to succeed. Besides visiting the men in the field, President Masiri also takes an active interest in local conservation projects and is determined to change attitudes. 
<laughs> wildlife in Botswana huh? was used for hunting, but that has been phased out. Now it's mainly for, for tourism, and we are also encouraging uh, people to do game farming. We are one of the very few countries that have the wealth of uh, wildlife that we have. It's a natural resource, it's a national resource. If we lose it, we'll never get it back again. And therefore, we must do all we can to protect it. To be able to protect this fragile wilderness, the men have to be taught its intricacies. Brigadier Hoho Twane is in charge of the training facility, which takes the form of an animal park with a difference. The brigadier is a soldier of note, formerly a top commando and a parachutist. But beyond that, each venture into the lion cages with him is like a journey into the soft soul of an animal keeper. His passion is lions. You've taught them all to sit down when they eat. Sit down, Sully. <coughs> Lions are not as <coughs> aggressive as we traditionally believe. They will not attack you unless you provoke them. And if it charges on you, almost 90% of the charges are mock charges. And uh, if you stand still, it will just go back. And don't sit down or try to take cover because it will get curious and want to investigate. His fascination for lions is shared by General Kama. As you see, even the commander is here. Cut it! Cut it, girl, cut it. It shows how important we, this training is. He takes it very serious. No, no, girl. <laughs> we also have had cases of lions getting into the tent, and they do not harm anybody. These lions perform a crucial role not only in familiarizing soldiers with predators, but also in the training of army horses. Lions and horses never have an easy relationship. The lions never seem to learn that the fence will always be there to cheat them. But horses destined for bush patrols are gradually broken in to the smell of lions here. Eventually, the training overpowers their natural instinct to bolt. It is a delicate job. They should not become too blasé. In the field, it's good to have some warning. claim 
their victims. At times, it feels as though an ambush is being laid by the very bush itself as it sulks with a forbidding silence, filled with the ghosts of the dead and the savagery of the living. training by Sergeant Isaacs. He was a man who knew snakes. At first, I was a little afraid, maybe a lot. It was terrible, snakes everywhere. But in the end, we all knew about snakes. Some guys never did. But uh, anyway. What we discovered is that if people don't know and don't understand and don't love animals, will not be prepared or will not really take this operation serious. What we do here, we teach our soldiers how to handle these animals and also instill love for the animals in the soldiers. So I'll demonstrate how you catch the Egyptian cobra. For catching Egyptian cobra first, you have to play with it for it to, to get tired. And you hold its tail like this. Even though they are dealing with some of the world's most deadly snakes, they are taught to simply remove them from their camps or paths. It would be ludicrous to spend all this energy protecting some creatures while killing others. And another thing is for a snake to strike at you. When you stand still, it will not realize that you are alive. It will think you are maybe a tree. You don't have to make a move. I want one of you to stand still, right? Stand still, don't make any move. Because if you make any move, it will strike at you, right? Stand still. You see? Tree climbing snakes might present a problem. Elephants, that is just um, on the job training, I'm afraid. Like in one of our camps, the elephants can smell the fresh water that our troops use when they bathe or when they cook. And then the elephants come into the camp and they abandon the camp um, and let the elephants have the free run of the place looking for the water source. And after some time the elephants give up and our soldiers come back into the camp and put back uh, the bits and pieces. But that's something which they just have to live with. of soldiers in the north increases daily. Here the abundance of elephants gives a false impression of a healthy environment. Hidden behind the ever more fleeting glimpses of rhinos and a screen of elephants, the grim efforts of the tireless Saili gang are shockingly revealed. Poachers were stepping up their activities. With the black rhino already extinct here, the white could soon follow. From each kill, tracks are followed using ever more experienced trackers. Each time, the poachers head due north towards the river. much easier for the poachers.
It's in these familiar swamplands that the Sahili poachers can most easily disappear. Poachers make up bundles of meat to carry with the ivory and rhino horn to markets in the north. But at last, they find a clear set of tracks and follow through the mosquito-ridden swamp. Armed with a knowledge of the bush and a rising confidence, the soldiers now penetrate the night, closing in on their prey. have an even greater advantage. Their tracks are quickly washed away, and with the poachers almost within their grasp, the patrol must be called off. Invisible poachers are everywhere in the soldiers' minds. intensifying night scopes to see through the inky night. Flares trigger the chase. At last, the poachers become real. Scrambling for cover, they run for their lives. Now, there is no cover of darkness, no place to hide. Pockets of poachers are run down in the eerie green shadows and gathered in for interrogation. We found some snares in this area of Shalimbo and we believe that uh, they are laid by your people. So, can you tell me anything about them? They just tell me. What did, what, what did they tell you? I can't tell when do they come to set these snares? No, actually, they tell me that before the sunset. Before sunset? Yes. Then what do they do with the meat? Some they eat, yes. some they sell. <coughs> These men are from outside of Botswana. And although they are small time poachers, valuable information about the gangs in the north flows readily. Under Botswana law, offenders are arrested and jailed. Few are deported. Amid the struggle to destroy or save, there are still many areas in Botswana in which peace prevails. Remnants of the past. Some national parks are 
situated along rivers with abundant water, where elephants are relaxed enough to play. Although diamonds are the top earning industry in Botswana, tourism is growing rapidly, and the real jewels amble along inside the national parks and wildlife areas. Tourism in the parks makes it awkward for poachers to hunt, but ironically, it also makes elephants more accustomed to man and therefore more vulnerable. Where poachers have left their mark, the atmosphere is very different. A single strand of wire has pulled closed around an adult bull's foot and has hamstrung six tons of animal. Each day, the wire snare cuts slowly deeper into his swelling leg. Even the elephant's intelligent attempt at self-medication by applying a dust bath will not save his life. Much of the elephant's existence is based on gentle communications. Now a rumble of concern is sent through the herd as they investigate the horror of his wound. In the areas of heavy hunting, stressed elephants dribble from the temporal glands on their faces. When they come across their own dying or dead, so often, their anxiety is extreme. For an animal that has learned to trust man the tourist, these acts of betrayal must be deeply disturbing. One bull refuses to accept his companion's fatal injury and tries to raise his limp body. Some have been known to carry away their wounded or ritually cast soil and branches on the dead. This attempt comes too late for the fallen bull.
Today, all that is left of most of the rhinos in Botswana is locked up in a vault. The precious horns. When the numbers of white rhinos dipped from over 200 to less than a dozen, an effort to capture this last handful had to be made. As a result of the fact that we had concentrated our efforts in a region called the Kwando and the Linyanti, quite a few of our rhinos were poached. And that is why a decision was made to translocate those rhinos in the Chobe to a rhino sanctuary in another part of the country. Guarded rhinos have their horns removed as a safeguard, even in captivity. Finally, the female and calf become captive, like state witnesses, held for their own safety. One rhino, already riddled with fresh poachers' bullets, died on the way, despite the rescue effort. The calf did not appreciate her isolated six-hour journey. But the danger is not yet over. Poaching bosses have an economic interest in the death of even these last dehorned rhinos. Their stockpiles of rhino horn will be even more valuable once total extinction is achieved. The high black market value of $5,000 per horn filters down even to poachers who are often poor but willing to take the ultimate risk for quick money. Two years later, the rhinos are still in the sanctuary under lock and key and constant watch. The feisty calf shows two years horn growth and has warmed to her guardians. But the watchtowers have begun to serve an even greater function. Along the sensitive river borders, soldiers now stand guard in towers, protecting even the wild animals in their shadow. The wilderness becomes a fortress. Its protectors dissolve in and out of the bush. Stealthy warriors like the invisible poachers they stalk. As they become part of that bush that conceals them, they see into its anguished soul as never before. A snared trunk cheats one elephant of most of each precious mouthful of water at a time when the dry season makes no allowances for the weak. They see into the heart of the beast that is man. When the soldiers become invisible themselves, the poacher's magic cloak suddenly drops away and reveals them. For the soldiers, there is a policy to use minimum force. If these poachers had been carrying automatic rifles, like the Saili gang, this would have been a very different scene. As they bring in more prisoners, a smoldering tension hangs over the interrogation. <laughs> Deep in the captive's hollow eyes burns a resentment and a bitter reminder to the soldiers that it won't always be this easy. 
why are your people crossing into Botswana to catch and kill our animals? Already the moral conflict of hunting down a man for killing animals can be troubling. Small successes start to emerge. Previously, 3,000 wire snares were collected in a year. Now it is already down to 400. But each tactic has a counter move. Each counter move creates a new challenge. Poachers now employ a tactic that is almost as old as Africa itself. Fire. Countries 50 to 70,000 elephants are already under pressure to find the food they need. Calves that usually spend so much of their time exploring or playing collapse in the heat. When the time comes to move on again, they are reluctant to be roused. The heat drives their thirsts but the open floodplains they must cross expose them to the poachers during the day. Any sign of man on the wind sends caution rumbling among them. The very young who can't use their trunks yet must stop to drink. For them, the pace is too fast. Unlike the tranquil elephants inside the parks, herds in heavily hunted areas spend less than a minute at the water in daylight hours, often simply gathering on the move. The weak and the young are often left behind as the herds hasten back into the tree line. now 
congregate away from the burning swamps.
The meat is fresh. The hippo stomach lining to be used for tribal medicine is still warm. Two shotgun rounds blasted at the nearest soldier sealed the fate of these poachers. Surrender could still have saved them. But the decision to kill still weighs heavily on General Kama and his men. I know it's hard to sometimes understand that people are getting killed for poaching, but it does put this into perspective. This is a mini war. their people getting killed than my men. The gang had been working at this mountain of meat for weeks, cutting, drying, and boating it north across the river. Their magic had betrayed them. They had thought they were invisible, protected from the bullets by a witch doctor's medication. Captured information tells of their deals and trading and indicates a larger gang back home. But even here, at least one poacher has escaped the initial attack. Slipping away from the firefight, through the butchery, he bolted down the hippo paths running without his shoes. Among the debris, yet another question is answered the final explanation of their apparent invisibility over the years. The soles of elephants' feet have been put to deceptive use, leaving behind no human tracks. Two poachers were killed who had the intention of coming here to kill everything in their sight. One of them escaped, but it's believed that he has been wounded because blood was seen on his tail. They saw a lion following that blood. With soldiers on his heels, the poacher limps for his life, choosing the softer trails. His tracks are clear. Hunter becomes the hunted. If the fugitive survives this nightmare, he will tell the rest of the gang what happened here today. It is an important message and a chilling deterrent. Over the last few years, more than 200 poachers have been rounded up. Very few are actually killed. But as long as there is wildlife in Africa, it seems there will always be poaching. General Kama is determined to let the battle continue. We know that we're succeeding. After four years, we've broken the back of the major poaching groups. Poaching has dropped off substantially. It's been hard going, costly, and a strain on resources and equipment. But at least from a poaching point of view, the future of the country's wildlife is very bright. Like the lions that squabble over their kill, these two forces do battle over the very soul of this country. With the success of these operations dancing on the wind like a breath of cool air over a parched land, the old 
Africa slowly re-emerges. But in Botswana at least, poachers can be sure that this chase will go on forever.